All right, so uh, welcome back. I hope that uh, we've all had an opportunity to um, go to some interesting breakout sessions and uh, have had a chance to at least refresh and have some coffee and think about what we just took in. Uh, this is the officially the, the very last session of the CrestCon, um, and we're very, very fortunate in that uh, we get to engage in a panel discussion with four experts from around the globe, uh, each uh, running important activities related to educational assessment and evaluation in um, their own countries. And um, the focus, of course, of this conference is on learning together to build partnerships to accelerate excellence and equity. And I, I find it befitting to learn from these experts and their experiences and their aspirations um, to achieve this goal. So from the, the left of the stage, um, Dr. Xingtao of Beijing Normal University he is a professor of education and statistics and measurement in the Collaborative Innovation Center for Assessment Toward Basic Education Quality. He is also the director of the National Assessment of Education Progress um, in, in China. And to Dr. Xing's right, we have Professor Heidi Haru uh, from the University of Gothenburg in, uh, in Sweden. And uh, uh, Heidi is a friend of Crest, has been our resident um, European researcher for a while now. And uh, she conducts research on student assessment. Uh, and she has worked in both Nordic countries and in the uh, United States, where she has been involved in developing teacher education programs and uh, student assessment and evaluation. An author of more than 100 books, reports, articles. Um, Heidi has just been a, a pro prolific contributor to the field. And she has also been in the area of international comparative survey. She's been a principal investigator of the Finnish PISA program in both, uh, in actually in all three years, 2009, 2012, and 2015. Um, and further to the right, we have uh, Professor Leonor Varas. Dr. Varas has a professional degree in uh, mathematical engineering and a doctoral degree in engineering science from University of Chile. She has been active in research in mathematical modeling, in mathematical education, standard setting, maintenance and development of educational assessment evaluation systems, and been participant in important national and international in initiatives connecting researchers, educators, and decision makers. Importantly, she is in charge of the Department of Educational Measurement, uh, Registration, and Evaluation out of the University of Chile that conducts the National College Entrance Exam in Chile. And last but not the least, we have uh, a visitor from Korea, Dr. Jimin Chol is currently the Vice President of the Division of Educational Evaluation at Korea Institute for Curriculum and Evaluation, otherwise known as KAIS. She has an academic background in educational psychology, including a PhD from Michigan State, majoring in educational measurement and evaluation. She is currently in charge of national and inter international comparative studies, such as PISA and TIMS, and her major experience has been in developing frameworks for student assessments, especially in scoring, reporting, based on in-depth analysis of various major assessments in Korea. She also currently serves in various capacities as members of international steering committees for such international evaluative studies. So um, without further ado, let's give some applause to our foreign and international visitors. So th the way that this session will go is that there will not be any PowerPoint presentation. Um, we will invite the speakers each to spend about 10 minutes to talk about issues around um, assessment evaluation as they relate to policy discussions, relate to research discussions, um, and, and public discussions uh, surrounding equity and excellence. And I have prepared a list of questions um, that 
perhaps the speakers will address, um, but perhaps they may choose to not address. And then I would also hope that at the end of the 40-minute um, the presentation period that the audience could come up and uh, engage in a discussion. Um, so these questions that I've preliminarily sent out to our panel is that, uh, for example, how were assessment systems historically developed and used in your country to support the goal of excellence and equity? And how is the public discourse changing in your country regarding access to and the quality of education systems? And what are the major drivers of change in education and assessment systems in particular? And what are some of the major barriers that you must overcome or you believe that the country must overcome to achieve the goal of excellence and equity? And have there been concrete steps being taken to address those barriers? And what can researchers and research do to aid such discussions and debates? And what role educational technology could play in all of the above? So, Without further ado, um, let's start from uh, perhaps the left of the stage, um, Professor Xing. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, uh, thank you very much again for uh, Professor Li Cai uh, invited us actually to uh, uh, join this panel discussion. Uh, 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 mm, so, uh, I think the, the topic of this panel is whether or not the large-scale assessment can improve educational quality and equity. Um, I know that currently there are a lot of debate uh, about how large-scale assessment, uh, is there any uh, problems of, uh, that the, this large-scale assessment may not improve educational quality, but instead actually to give some kind of uh, weakness for educational quality. Uh, in, context, uh, in context of China, a Chinese educational system, we have, uh, uh, there is a debate existed about uh, uh, two, uh, 20 years, the people just argue whether or not uh, such high-stake large-scale assessment actually can improve educational quality. So we have uh, two terminology called that kind of debate. So one side is we, uh, our government and society hopes uh, education can, it's uh, uh, literacy orient oriented or quality oriented uh, education, which means that our educational system should improve students all around the development. But on the other hand, uh, exist education, we call that is a test-oriented uh, uh, education. So in, in real situation, many schools, teachers, and students, they, they actually, uh, the purpose of, the, of them is just to get a good test score and go uh, good uh, high schools or universities. So we call that, uh, the, you, you can see that uh, obviously a debate uh, of literacy or quality of anti-education versus, of, uh, uh, versus uh, uh, test oriented. And um, I, it has been a long time, people just argue, uh, say that we may, may, should we modify or re just delete this large scale assessment? So, but uh, 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 obviously it's, it's quite hard as in Chinese situation. Uh, although people criticize a large scale assessment like a, a high school or college entry examination or national uh, assessment program, but people still think that this kind of the large scale assessment is kind of the fundamental uh, line for social uh, 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 justice and social equity. So if we delete this kind of assessment or test, so we'll cause uh, another severe problems. So currently, uh, policy uh, researchers and uh, policy and academic researchers uh, just raise another issue that um, beyond with the debate of whether or not we should have a, a test or anti-test. 
uh, or oriented uh, education, we may need actually reform our large scale assessment and uh, our high stake uh, uh, test. Um, so right now, Ministry of Education actually uh, do one work. So they ask uh, our high stake uh, 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 test and uh, large scale assessment. Uh, should match our curriculum standard, because traditionally the test uh, form uh, uh, framework uh, are kind of different from our curriculum standards. That's cause uh, cause problem. But now Ministry of Education ask each high uh, test and large scale assessment, uh, their framework should match our curriculum standards, and especially. The actually the higher uh, the panel of experts and the go through review each uh, test items. For example, for high school entry examination, uh, the this kind of test actually were organized by local educational administration. So currently, uh, Ministry of Education ask local educational administration they just uh, provide their uh, test items to this panel of experts. The experts will review item by item and whether or not this item actually suitable for our curriculum uh, requirement. So I think that's one issue is very interesting because um, the reason we have this kind of the activity, we think that the debate is a debate. The, you, you can exist this kind of debate for a long time, but we need to do something. Uh, the, the good choice is that we reform and modify our high stack uh, test and uh, large scale assessment uh, instead of just uh, say we, we get rid of this uh, test. So that's uh, one point. Uh, another point is that we need to go beyond the assessment uh, or test because te any high stack test uh, or large scale assessment is just a tool. Uh, for it's not a purpose for our education. So as long as we get some kind of information or results from the large scale assessment, even from high stake test, we need to do something further. For example, for large scale assessment, it's typically that we can identify some kind of the, uh, policy factors or practical factors uh, which can in uh, strongly linked to our students' outcome. So, but that's, that's all. Uh, people just stop here. Uh, that's not enough. We need to go beyond. We need to uh, actually conduct some kind of policy or practic practical intervention study and go beyond. If we find this kind of relationship, whether or not we can modify this kind of the policy or pra practice uh, activities, we can see whether or not our students' performance much better. So that's what I think. Perfect. Should I go further? Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation, uh, Professor Li Sai. It's a pleasure to be here. And. Uh, before I start, I would like to recognize we have actually several other uh, Finnish researchers here uh, present at this room. Would you be so kind and stand up so everybody can see you? This is a rare situation when we have uh, a lot of, uh, well, it's the first time here in the US where I have so many uh, Finnish colleagues here. Uh, from the uh, assessment scenery uh, from Finland. And we also have uh, one here on the right, Sirku Kupiainen, uh, the lady, would you like to? <laughs> and she has been involved in the Finnish uh, assessment scenery for, I think, more than 20 years. And, and she is a huge resource, so if you're interested, just um, give her a, um, a talk later on. Anyway, um, Lee also gave a short introduction already, so I'm not going to go further into that one. Uh, just tell you that I've been working here in the United States for uh, almost three years soon. And it's been a pleasure. Very different from the Finnish educational uh, scenery and policies and practices, jumping into a, um, a very different type of world. 
Anyway, uh, Finland has been uh, recognized uh, as a high um, uh, high performing country or among the high performing countries in a lot of the international assessment, I can piece at Hims and Pearls for almost 20 years now. And uh, what is different, um, and a lot of the Finnish education system has um, received, received a lot of attention. So we have had a lot of PISA tourism in the country and everybody's interested in seeing how, how do we do it. And, um, but we don't talk so much about the assessment part, which is also very different compared to many other countries around the globe. Um, an important difference uh, compared to Finland and many other countries is that uh, we have pretty low economical investments in our education system. So here in the US, uh, in the basic education, uh, student cost per year would be around um, almost 12,000 euros, I don't know, 13, 14,000 dollars. And in, in Finland, we're somewhere around 9,000 euros, 10,000. Uh, dollars approximately. So with a you know low investment, the outcome is uh, pretty decent. So the system is uh, exceptionally equitable in terms of low segregation, and uh, the it doesn't really matter in, into which school you put your child. Uh, it doesn't have such a big of an effect on the educational outcome of the child. So the difference in school between the schools is not that big, and the socioeconomical. Uh, background of the student doesn't have a huge impact on the educational outcome. Uh, so how the, the first question was how the assessment system was developed in Finland uh, historically and the early years of the comp uh, comprehensive education system uh, had um, were, could be characterized in a way with uh, a lot of strict control and specific of specific inputs and outputs, like in many countries we can see it today. So obligatory in-service teacher training uh, of contents of the national curriculum, and we have pre-examination of textbooks, and also an active school inspection. And schools were held accountable for the achievement as well. And um, then we had a few reforms along the way, uh, curriculum reforms and, and more freedom uh, were given for local decision making and ability grouping was uh, uh, abolished in the 1980s. In the 1990s, uh, the school inspection was completely abolished in Finland, so we don't have at the moment any type of school inspection and um, uh, schools sort of write their own curriculum and, uh, and the assessment uh, was, or the, it was sort of a decentralization of the education system. So the teachers have a huge impact and influence uh, how the assessment is conducted uh, in the schools. Um, so today, uh, or we have had a lot of several periods without a clear national structure for education assessment. And um, there's a lot of freedom and responsibility uh, how the assessment practices uh, are conducted by the local authorities or those ones who provide the education. In Finland we don't have, um, in that sense that we have here in the United States, private schools. Uh, all of the schools more or less are publicly owned uh, and uh, of course follow the national uh, curriculum. So nowadays uh, we have um, curriculum, curriculum based assessment uh, and thematic assessments according to the national assessment pl plan. Uh, so we have the national assessment conducted by a center uh, in Finland. And then we have, of course, the international assessments. And uh, nowadays we participate in those ones pretty regularly. Um, if you're interested uh, in reading more about the European context and uh, especially the Finnish context, we're just about to come out uh, with a book I had to read the, the uh, title of the book, it always sounds so fancy. And um, so it's called um, Monitoring of Student Achievement in a 21st Century European Policy Perspective and Assessment Strategies, and it's published by Springer. And uh, we have, um, uh, uh, it's an edited volume, we have more than 20 
uh, in uh, 20 countries involved in that one. So that gives an uh, overview of the assessment systems. Um, the, qu uh, the quality and access is something that I think is uh, pretty much thought about in each and every country. And when it comes to the education, important questions. In Finland, we have probably now had in the topic of discussion quality of early childhood education, dropout rates uh, from, the uh, from the basic education, uh, quality of vocational education, and so on. And um, uh, the so what are the sort of um, uh, major drivers of change in the education system and assessment systems in particular uh, would be in Finland that uh, we see our teacher education system as one of the most important parts uh, of the assessment structure as well uh, in that sense that uh, high quality teachers uh, are needed in order to have a high quality uh, education system. Uh, and of course the economical possibilities have a huge impact. It's not so easy always uh, when you are a country and you have been uh, on the educational scenery on high level for a long time. Uh, it very often, uh, very often in this case, uh, uh, it's easy to cut, so to say, the edu edu from the education money. And that's something that we have seen in Finland as well happening. So the education uh, system has been uh, cut economically very heavily during the last years. And the challenges with that is that uh, we will see the effect of those uh, cuts uh, later on. It will take 10, 15 years before we can see the, the outcomes. And, um, and, um, and we call it sort of a, how would I put it, like a PISA effect. Because you're, you know, the poly, uh, policy makers are, are arguing that, well, we're doing fine, we're doing fine, we can take a little bit off from the education system and so on. So it can sort of slow down the, the development of an education system. Uh, our challenges in Finland is definitely when it comes to the students uh, with an immigrant background. Uh, we have seen a huge immigration wave throughout the European countries. Uh, in general, um, our students with an immigrant background are lagging behind um, by the end of the compulsory education around uh, one to two, well, two years in general, uh, by the end of the compulsory education, which is uh, uh, unacceptable for a country. So, so in Finland, we need to make sure that we are a country that is uh, that has that provides good education for all of its students, not only for for one group, and. Um, and so, and to the last question, uh, what can researchers do to aid the discussion and the actions on the field of education? And I see, especially now spending some time here in the United States, that we as uh, uh, researchers need to be more aware and more effective in discussing our uh, uh, research results with the pub public as well as with, the, uh, with uh, policy makers. So thank you. And forward to Chile. Yes, it's my turn. Uh, first of all, I have to thank you, thank Chris, thank Professor Lee Tsai and, uh, for, for this beautiful conference, for the organization. And thank you for, to all of you for attending this session, this last session. I have to explain first that we are not in charge of the quality of education because we have in Chile a special agency called Agency for the Quality of the Education. And, uh, we are just in charge of the selection process, the college entrance for 41 universities. We have an integrated system that is in the same process we take the entrance, the college entrance test, and we run the algorithm to assign the applicants to the different programs in these 41 universities. We use this test scores and also GPA and 
an index, a ranking in the, the about it's uh, the relative position of one student in, uh, concerning regarding their classmates. So this is our system, and so our uh, uh, concern with the topic of this session is uh, um, fairness, quality of the selection process, that is, that it has to be a objective, fair, and uh, process, and the, one of the important things is validity of what we are doing, assessing the students, and also that um, our test has to be uh, predictive about the future uh, behavior, the future uh, outcomes at the university level. So the size of our process is we have 300,000 uh, applicants each year. We run the process, the selection process once a year. The selection process and the application of the test are in the same period. So we don't have the possibility to take the test in another time of the year. Yes, at the end of November when uh, school are finishing and uh, the, the applicants has to have at that time um, they have to com have completed the high school uh, education. So, um, the, we have uh, uh, s some other problems with the size. We have a complicated geography and the fairness is also that we have to reach every small town in islands uh, where there are applicants. We have to come with our booklets. And uh, this process is so important and so high stakes that we are constantly in the media. Um, 25,000 people participate in this application, 3,200 police officers uh, help us to uh, have a safe application. One million two hundred to one thousand booklets has to be delivered to all the country, and we have more than nine thousand classrooms where the test is, uh, is administered. We have big problems both with quality and uh, and equity. We have, our test is a test completely curriculum oriented since 2003. The test we have now is a test that has been introduced in 2003, completely curriculum oriented. Before of that, we had another test that was not curriculum oriented. It was much more looking forward to the abilities that are necessary to a good, uh, um, to be successful at the university. At that time, in 2003, the government, the Ministry of Education and the universities were looking just for an elite. Um, and so they didn't uh, take into account that we have two high school curriculums in Chile, a general track and a vocational track. And at that time, 40% of the students coming from the higher education um, institutions came from the vocational track. And they have another curriculum, so they never had the opportunity to learn what we are asking them in our test. Um, many years from that, now in April of this year, the International, the Inter-American Court for Human Rights um, accepted a law, uh, a, a, a law, a lawsuit is a, against the Chilean uh, state because of this uh, lack of fairness to these students coming from the uh, vocational track. Uh, 
higher education. So um, our equity problem is a very serious one. Uh, and uh, it has to be uh, faced now because we have also now a new um, a reform, a higher education reform, where all these issues has, uh, has, came, has came to the public discussion and we have to uh, improve our system and our test. So we have two agendas at the moment, a short time and a long time agenda. One is to enhance what we have to make uh, progress and what we have, and simultaneously to develop a new system, new test, and uh, to, to create a, a better solution than what we have now. Uh, so we have problems with the definition of the test, with the predictive validity. Some of the tests, our test battery is very short. We have just four tests. A reading comprehension test, a math test, just one math test, before we had two math tests, uh, one science test, inside the science test the, the applicants can choose a part of the test has to be specialized in biology or physics or chemistry, and, but we gave just one score for the science test, nobody knows at the, at the university level or at the public level what does it mean, this science score, and uh, one test in uh, social science. So just four tests, four scores. And um, the math test is a test that is too difficult for the population that, uh, because it's mandatory. Le the language test and the math, math test are mandatory. and. Um, this math test is too difficult for the population that uh, has to uh, take the test and not so difficult, we have problems to, to select the, the students to the engineer school or the uh, university programs that uh, needs more mathematics. Before of that, before 2003, we had two math tests, one basic test and one advanced test. We need this test because we cannot, with one test, um, ha have a good uh, predictive test for all these uh, uh, programs. So at the moment, the only um, cut score we have, that it's the habilitation to take a part in the selection process has a cut score for the mandatory test, really with the average of the mandatory test, that in the case of the math test is almost indistinguishable. I don't know if this, this uh, we cannot distinguish this, uh, this behavior from the random behavior because the, our test has 75 uh, items with five alternatives. So if, you, if one applicant just give random answers, they will have almost 15 correct answers. And now this CAT score is uh, achieved with uh, uh, 16, 17 right answers. So this test cannot stay in place, but it's very difficult for us to make changes because we uh, run this process and take this test by a mandate of the Council of Rectors. It's even not the Ministry of Education. So um, the reform we, uh, that has to be in place, that has to be installed in two more years, it's very important because um, the institutional dependence of the process will be from the Ministry of Education and thus uh, assures that the decision has to be taken more transparent uh, to the public and all the stakeholders. And so this type of uh, difficulties has to be solved in a better framework. Um, we have also problems with equity because Chile is a very, very segregated society. So 
if we have a test that is so aligned with the curriculum, what we are measuring is the opportunity of the uh, applicants to uh, have learned this content, so to have been exposed to that curriculum. Our uh, educational system is also very uneven, very segregated, so the opportunities are very different, are not the same. And besides of that, we have an additional problem because um, one third of the peoples that register to the selection process are not from the current cohort, are not coming direct from the high school. They have time invested, one or two years, to prepare to the test. And they do better, of course, that the ones that hasn't prepared just hasn't dedicated one or more years just to prepare to, te to the test. So the admittance, in the admittance, the participation of this population is 44 percent. So they have, um, we have, we have given more opportunities to people with more money and time to invest in this preparation. And this has two consequences. This uneven results in the selection, and we have to look who, uh, to the way we calculate the scores and make a difference between different populations. And we have to have an agreement of the Council of Rectors and the Ministry of Education. And also we have a problem with piloting the items because we cannot pilot items during the uh, official application of the test because our tests are completely, completely uh, reproduced because of the high stakes and so on. And um, so we have to run different piloting process. And we, we do a very sophisticated pilot, pilot process to represent the population that are in the last year of the, of the higher education, higher education, not higher education, second, the higher school, high school education. But if 30% or 33% of the test takers are not in, this, uh, in the high school, we cannot represent them uh, rightly. So we have the opportunity now to to make everything better, and uh, we need, of course, to 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 open these uh, discussions to the stakeholders and to the researchers. And we are promoting research uh, in in this area. With our, we have an amount of data accumulated for many many decades, and also Chile has a very good. Um, um, as, uh, assessing program from this agency for the quality of education. So we have many, many data available to do good research. And we are very uh, proud to be here and to hear of your research and your uh, progress. And we want to invite you to, to take this data and to make research with our data. Thank you very much. Um, can you turn up? Oh, okay. So it's past noon, so it's better for me to say good afternoon. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, as introduced, I'm Jimin Zhou. I'm currently working from KAIS, but what I'm trying to say within 10 minutes is about some of the examples, especially currently, you know, what kind of the assessment research actually apply to the uh, education policies. So I'm going to give you three examples, but uh, before that, I just want to remember that 2000. Seven, I think it was, uh, the officers in Ministry of Education in Chile visited in Korea and then trying to benchmark our education system. But at the time, uh, they set up the, the online scoring system for, uh, for the national exam is because of the geography problems. So at the time, I had the idea about to set up the online screen for our own national assessment of education achievement. So at the same month, you know, when I met the officers in Chile, we went, you know, we flew to the Chile and the benchmark their systems. Actually, the Pearson at the time to support the Chile's education system online. But anyhow, we benchmark, and then after two years, finally, we, you know, 
know, set up the, our online schooling system for the national assessment system. So this kind of the, the gathering, share our experiences and learn each other is going to be really important issue. So, so thank you so much for the inviting me. And I think it's better for me to start with a little bit summary of uh, introductory of our introduction of our institutions because that is going to be helpful to understand about how those kind of assessment or evaluation results can be actually applied to the, uh, to the education policies. Um, the kinds is, as you can expect from the title of our institutions, yes, in our um, institutions, the government agencies, but not belong to the Ministry of Education. We are belong to the uh, Prime Minister. So we work very closely with the Ministry of Education, but still government agencies. But one of the good things is, uh, uh, as a, you know, from the researcher perspective, still we can raise our research questions by our own, and then you know, the provider can provide the uh, educational policy recommendations to the educational educator um, decision makers. And uh, also we are designing, we are the only unique institutions actually design the national curriculums, designing, developing, and also um, designing, developing, and implementing all the international, national uh, assessments. And we do have a three big division is that uh, one is for the curriculum, for the teaching and learning, and, and of course, you know, division for the uh, education evaluation. And we all know that those three are very key elements of education. So one of the, um, the best, uh, the good characteristic that uh, the kinds we do have is we can build up the reciprocal, uh, reciprocal cooperations between the curriculum and teaching and, and assessment. That is the most important. So the, the Chinese colleague, you know, he already you know, mentioned the assessment is a great tool. It's not a purpose of the education. Definitely, yeah, definitely. So the most important thing is going to be we can feed back to the you know, revision of our national curriculum or uh, the uh, enhance the quality of the education. Definitely, those kind of the three key elements that has to work together uh, all the time. In Kaisi's case, we do have a, at current system, uh, currently, we do have 180 doc, uh, researchers with the doctorates and 90 of our administrative staff and 100, 150 of the uh, part-time, full-time research assistants. So more than 450 people working uh, for these issues. That's why we can, you know, uh, we can deal with uh, many of the issues related on the evaluations. And, well, and also, I just want to you know, quickly mention that you know that the previous um, uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations was Ban Ki-moon. Because of the, his position, he got a lot of questions from the all around. Uh, it, it's because the Korea is a very unique country. So if we transformed from the recipient to the donor country within half a century. So people ask, you know, what, is, what is the you know, key factors to lead the, you know, Korea's uh, economic success? His answer was always education. Korea is a very small country, it's very homogeneous, and not many of the resources except the human resources. So, so education is very important. And then, but education is too broad. So uh, the next two questions was, what is the key elements in education? And actually, most of the educators in Korea, we believe that, of course, there are a bunch of reasons, but there is a two priority uh, the key elements. Is the first one is the quality of education, uh, quality of the teachers. And the second one is that we are very good at collecting the data. What that means is that we are very good at establishing educational uh, policies related on evidence or data. So there is two you know, key elements as we already you know, mentioned uh, for, uh, for our strengths in our education system. And especially you know, the teachers, are, uh, we all know that teachers great role in education. And uh, actually to be the teacher in Korea is very, very difficult. The teacher selection exam is a very high state. Only 10% of the applicants can only pass that. What the mean is that, and also the teacher has a very good social images in Korea and high pension. So every year, means of Education actually run the surveys on the students and the you know, parents, you know, who wants to be what. And st still, uh, you know, the, the, the teachers are always top rank in the job positions. That is one of the very good signs, right? And especially in the top performance in the students, you know, they are wants to be the always wants to be the doctors or lawyers, but still some percentage of the high performance students wants to be the teachers. 
that is one of the, the sign of the, the quality. And we do have a very uh, strong the pre and in-service programs for the teachers. Whatever the things change, like the teaching and learning and curriculums, the first thing is going to be to try to make the teachers understand what is changed and what has to be changed and why has to be changed. Those kind of the training is really important. And the data, the evidence, um, is related about the, our uh, the today's uh, talk. Um, the uh, Korea's uh, case, uh, we participated in the international assessment from the first cycle. The PISA teams from the first cycle, we, we participate. And as you all know that from the many of the various of the media, Korean students perform well continuously from the first cycle up to now. Of course, in the PISA 2015 was just released last year, but little drops of the, um, the mean score of the Korean students perform, but still very, you know, um, perform well. Uh, but we all know that PISA is not a curriculum-based test at all, but TIMS is a different story. TIMS is the curriculum-based test. All the participant countries, all the participant countries are supposed to, you know, send the, the curriculum and more core concepts related on the curriculum is tested by the teams. Anyhow, the Korean students, well, both the teams and you know, uh, 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 the PISA and even ICLS. But uh, one of the problem is that one of the the messages, implications that we are getting from the PISA and teams is that even though Korean students perform well in the cognitive areas, but the other one, like the non-cognitive and affective domains, always our indexes, career indexes, are below than you know, way below you know, comparing to the other countries. For example, even those students who got all the items right, if we are saying, do you have a confidence in math? No. Do you like math? No. Do you enjoy math? We are asking the students who got all the items right, but still they says no. Okay, so but we all know that as an educator, that that's going to be a fact. That's going to be affected in the students, the future career passes or whatever. So our government, we need to do something. That's why one of the very big uh, educational policy based on those PISA teams and, and national assessment of educational achievements, we found out that we need to do something for that. So uh, one of the, the policies that I'd like to introduce is the free semester, exam free semester. What is that? Is that every middle school has to have the one semester without any test. There is no paper test in this semester. No midterm, no final. So that we are trying to make them enjoy. So very important, the hard issues in Korea is, to, uh, is kind of uh, activation of the happy learning, trying to make them happy yeah, to learn to find out their talents for the future. So that is one of the policies related on the result of the, um, the, uh, our uh, assessments, the international and national level of that. And also, the, we are running, there is a two very representative, representative national level of assessment. One is the college scholastic ability test, which is the high, high stake exam in Korea. And then the other one is national assessment of education achievements, uh, only one minute left, but I'm going to have one more minute. <laughs> um, but both are the def definitely the curriculum-based test. But uh, I don't know whether you have heard about that uh, yesterday, uh, the, but the same date of uh, here today, the, our minister has changed. Um, the previous minister is only served for one or uh, 15 months. But now, from, from today, you know, we have a new minister. The, one of the big reasons is going to be about related on the evaluation issues because the college uh, address the uh, administration and a college admission office, that, that kind of the, the policy is really important. And many stakeholders in education have the different ideas, different opinions for that. So that's why you know, you know, uh, the politicians decide to, to change you know, some of the policies. The first thing is to change the minister. But, yeah. Hard to say that, anyhow. And one of the, the big uh, issues or implications from the National Assessment of Educational Achievement at this moment is that we believe that it's because, you know, we, we our government already uh, announced the um, 2015 revised the curriculum. So that curriculum is a little, uh, very different from the previous ones. So most of the various uh, 21st century skill competencies are very much emphasis in our uh, revised national curriculum. So Based on that, we have to change all the system, all the kind of the issues related to assessment at the national level and also school level. So one of the educational policy uh, starting this year is 
is the uh, process fortified assessment is very important and that is implemented this year. What that is, of course, you know that the assessment has to be uh, as a, the process of learning, especially you know, within the classes. So school has, a, I mean, teachers has a more um, authority to you know, assess the students, uh, the performance in, in, in cognitive and non-cognitive area. So that is the one of the also um, evaluation issues. I think I have to stop here. Thank you. Yes. And uh, thank you very much again, our distinguished panelists. Uh, we have quite a bit of time for discussions and uh, questions and answers. Um, are there questions from the audience? I would like to begin with the audience first. I have, I have quite a few here, so. I had a question about the, the Finland education and the um, immigrants' lack of being um, at Target. How is that measured? Is it measured at the very end or is it measured? I mean, how are they able to progress if they are already behind? <clears throat> a good question. Uh, we actually, for the first time uh, in the history of Finland, uh, we did a larger assessment on our students with an immigrant background. You know, the entire Finland is 5.4 million people. And we don't have that type of assessments that you can find here in the United States. So this is sort of the background. And for the, when the students are, um, all the assessments are uh, sample based. So the first time when all the students are assessed, it is uh, before they enter the university, so to say. So we had very little information uh, about our students with an immigrant background in general. And, uh, so the Ministry of Education uh, decided that they wanted to have a little bit more of information and in the piece of 2012 uh, we did an oversampling uh, of our students with an immigrant background and that's how we sort of found out uh, this um, uh, sort of um, challenges that we have and, and uh, most of the, we can explain most of the uh, differences between the students uh, that have um, doesn't have an immigrant background, those ones who do. So differences uh, pretty much explained with the social, economical, and cultural background in general. So uh, it's not even necessarily a question about the education system. It's a question about the society and societal uh, questions. And uh, I, I would like to follow up uh, on, on the question raised earlier regarding uh, uh, children with immigrant background. I mean, it, obviously, it's a it's a it's a large issue here in the U.S. Um, but also, as we heard from uh, our dean's opening remarks and his keynote, uh, there are also internal migration. So, for example, in the case of uh, of China, probably the the larger issue is uh, is the internal migration. Uh, some estimated to be some somewhere around 250 million uh, a year, right? So, could you comment, Professor Xi? Uh, yeah. Um, that's uh, actually a big challenge for our K-12 system uh, because, you know, uh, uh, because of uh, the urbanization process, so parents just uh, go to um, cities, uh, big cities, so which means we have lots of uh, migrant uh, kids and we also have lots of left behind kids. Some kids just uh, stay in a very poor uh, village or a poor area, but their parents go goes to the uh, city to find a job to do their work. So uh, currently, actually, governments uh, pay a great attention about that part, and uh, they try to uh, they they try to tackle this uh, population by. And give some kind of financial support and give some kind of intervention programs. Um, yeah, that, that's a lot. Of, but it, that, this question is too, broad, too big, so it's hard to use a few words 
to e e explain that right, part. Right, of course, of course. Um, economic, political, and, uh, and educational, of course. Um, so, so I want to also ask a, a question of, of all the, the panelists here, um, because I, I think that in each one of your own countries, there are some relevance to this. It has lots of relevance to the US, of course. Um, that is the reach, the increasing reach of higher education and its implications on selection exams and uh, the use of educational assessments. So could you comment broadly? So for example, in the, in the case of uh, my understanding of the case of, say, for example, Korea uh, or many developed economies where the, the uh, penetration of higher education in um, young adult population has been on the rise and uh, people have been told that uh, college education is, uh, is generally a positive thing for life outcomes and for especially for uh, one's career advancement. Um, and yet at the same time, um, I think that many economies are faced with, uh, with the prospect of a dwindling fertility rate lower than replacement level. So um, Japan, for example, is, is one such case where uh, you know, essentially there is a there is an overcapacity, and similarly in, for instance, in in Taiwan. So, could you comment on such issues about the changing nature of the population and uh, the reach of higher education, use of assessment tools to guide students into higher education? Well, we can. Yeah, well, maybe I could, I could start with. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so uh, when it comes to the possibilities for students to uh, study at the university, um, I think we have the similar system than in Korea in that sense. Uh, that is, um, uh, it's open for everybody, free for everybody, uh, which also makes it uh, very competitive uh, compared to a lot of universities. Uh, for instance, in the United States. So the teacher education uh, would have um, a rate of um, uh, 8 to 12 percent per year that are able to enter the programs. Uh, you had several other questions as well on... Um, so, so, so for example, let me, let me just uh, yeah. clarify. I, I may not be totally clear. So, so for example, if you, if you just think about, um, let's say, the case of uh, mainland China, in, in 1980, uh, 1978, those, those, at least the modern college entrance exam system was put in place. Mm -hmm. Some incarnations of that, but, but the system that we have now witnessing for the last 40 years you see in AML in China is something that started in late 1970s. And at the time, the, the raw admissions, the, the proportion of students who get to go to college compared to both the general population of school going age population as well as um, uh, those who have an intention to go to go to college is very small. So one could argue from a psychometrician's angle that you pretty much just do any test you want and you scream the top and you will have accomplished your task regardless of either excellence or equity questions mm -hmm. or validity questions. Mm -hmm. But now you're faced with, so for example, in certain provinces, I was looking at some statistics because uh, I, was, I was curious about it, uh, the, the admissions rate is uh, approaching 70, 80 percent of the, of the school going age population. Mm -hmm. So what do you do about that? You can't use the same test or the same strategies mm -hmm. to admit students. And, and here's another related question, which is uh, vocational education, vocational training, which is absolutely important as we have had in the last 10, 15 years in the US, this discussion about not just college readiness, but career readiness and what it means to be career ready, what kind of skills that the uh, secondary, primary and secondary education system must produce in order for students to be ready either for training or for uh, readiness to go into the workforce. And, and those are some of the questions that was on my mind when I was, uh, I was hearing you all talk about it. Please. Yes, I think uh, Chile is a very good example of this uh, enormous change in that um, in that dimension about the uh, population that uh, are uh, entering now to the 
higher education system because in Chile uh, we have uh, universities and two other types of institutions like community college are not, not, not exactly like community college. From it is, uh, there are two other types, one of uh, programs that last for two years and one program for four years. And normally university programs are for five and more years. Uh, um, and uh, now, but nothing is for free in Chile. The university is uh, it's not cheap at all. At, uh, but we have recently a new policy, a state policy, that gives a gratuity, the studies are for free, for the six first desires of the population, the income has to be at, the, at this decide. And this is, that is for university and also non-university higher education institution. So with this policy in place, we need to select. So the, the system we run now, it's a national system, it's very important. At the time, at the end of November, December, January, we are every day in the news because of the system and the one thing that's all what it, it's in the country. But just 24% of the admitted in the whole system, considering also this other institution, are selected with our system. So the change is really huge. We need instruments to select a, a completely new population. And even in these 41 uh, universities that are uh, um, participating in our system, I think now with the, this uh, gratuity policy in place, almost one half or near one half of the new admitted are first generation in the university. So it's really a very, very huge change and uh, we need, obviously, a different tests. Everything has to be reinvented, recreated. Okay. Yeah, Korea. Uh, yeah, of course. You know, Korea is in trying to ready for that issues to also. Uh, for example, what of the you know what of the educational policy related on the high school is the master. So students who, who just you know after the high school who wants to go on the society directory, you know we already made uh, some kind of uh, in the master. We call the master schools. And so uh, students go there and you know right away you know after the graduation they can start their work uh, easily in any of the companies. And also even the college scholars the ability to test this is system the framework of the CSA is very much you know, changed a lot. For example, um, CSET is trying to uh, provide uh, 51 subject matters. What they mean is the students can choose whatever the subject matter uh, depends on their needs. Where the, the college or department asks the students to submit uh, Based on that needs, the students can select. The all those students uh, need any of the competitive score anymore. You know, students uh, can choose whatever the subject matter they want depending on their the college or uh, the university they once need. And also five years, six years ago, we already adapted the college admission officers system. What they mean is the system is not the only condition for students to submit to, uh, to the, the colleges to select the students. You know, uh, the high school records and all other uh, extra activities also very important for the university or co uh, college to select the students. So those kind of, but still the number of students, um, I think the same as all other countries too in Korea is always the birth rate is very low and the number of the you know, students is getting decreased definitely. So, but the still uh, in society, uh, even though we have more than 200 colleges, what they mean is that if a student wants to go on their studies in uh, college, they can study in colleges. But the problem is that uh, all those three university colleges are pretty much ranked. So what they mean is the top ranked university in the go on their studies, that is the one of the, in the big issues. So our petitions try to equalize the, you know, many of the universities at the same uh, levels, but uh, that is really difficult. But it's because of the change of the society or educational environments, I think you know, sooner can be happen. But that, that's what, you know, it's a curious situation. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, first, I would like to uh, gives uh, two uh, percentage uh, for uh, this issue. 
the first uh, the college entry rate over uh, the, the age population roughly is about in China is uh, currently is about uh, forty five percent. It's like uh, so college entry rates over the high school students population is about eighteen percent roughly in different uh, provinces. Uh, so uh, as Lee mentioned, that uh, um, three decades ago, the, there, uh, the, the rate is about uh, maybe 10 percent of each population. So that's a tremendous uh, progress actually for higher education. So currently, actually, government, uh, uh, of course, the one total score is is not enough uh, to um, to distinguish the students uh, based on their uh, just the total school to go to different universities. So currently, uh, Ministry of Education encourage uh, 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 actually uh, uh, universities and the colleges to um, actually select the students not just based on total school, uh, test score, but also their uh, their uh, bunch, uh, uh, their several. Uh, I should say, comprehensive performance document. So, which means that students should submit, uh, submit to uh, universities and colleges there uh, whether or not they participate in some kind of social experience, whether or not they do some uh, kind of the, uh, volunteer work, all these kind of documents. It's, it's pretty much like American style. Besides our SAT or ACT score, uh, students should provide some, uh, many materials to demonstrate their uh, ability and the potential. Uh, currently, actually, in China, uh, we also actually encourage that. But uh, of course, it's not easy. Uh, because in China, uh, the equity issue is a fundamental issue. So when students provide this kind of materials, the society uh, uh, already worry about whether or not it's true. Because you you know that uh, students or their parents can do some uh, you know, make up work, to so that's always a challenge actually uh, for for this. But I think that currently Chinese government uh, uh, to encourage uh, we use uh, multiple indicators to select students. Uh, so instead of just one total score, this is one uh, perspective. Another pr perspective, you know, although the, we know that uh, uh, college entry examination have a strong washback effect on our K to twelve education, so because this kind of test, um, teachers uh, teachers uh, teachers in instruction students learning is not based on our curriculum <coughs> standards but based on our test uh, framework. So. How what kind of the uh, content uh, were included in your test? So they will just teach that. So uh, uh, that's why I mentioned at the beginning that the government is trying to do some work. They ask um, um, national educational uh, examination authority that they should actually to release their uh, test uh, uh, specification. But the aligned test spe specification to our national curriculum standards to demonstrate that their framework actually come from our curriculum standard. So, and uh, that's why we I also mentioned that uh, currently, a uh, Ministry of Education held a group of experts to review uh, the different uh, test items. Um, so they trying to say that look. Because you are, because of you are, this this kind of test items not match with our, our curriculum standards, the cost problem. You should modify your test format and test specification and the items. So that's. Thank you. Are there further questions, comments from the audience? And I know that I'm between yeah. you and your lunch. So. <laughs>
Thank you very much, and thank you again, our very distinguished panelists. Uh, this concludes, this, this session concludes the conference. Um, we hope to see you again uh, very soon in another Crest gathering, and uh, I hope that you took something interesting away with you uh, from all these discussions and the talks and the keynotes. Um, the, the conference website will remain active and we will try to um, upload additional materials to the conference website and uh, come back and see us. Talk to those of us who are here and talk to uh, other participants. Lunch, I believe, is being served at the restaurant. Same kind of setup, is that right? Or okay. Ah, okay, so no, no ticket needed, just a, just a name tag. Um, and uh, for those who can indeed stay in the afternoon, we will have the Lynn Memorial Award lecture coming up at 2.30, uh, I believe. And uh, thank you.